All right, Jason, can you um, can you introduce your character, please? Yes, it's still showing off air. Oh, there we go. Now it says live. Okay, so I will be playing Valis Whitlock or Valis Whitlock, however you want to say his name. He is a working on his. Uh, postdoctoral work in mathematics at Oxford University. And uh, today he is kind of winding down, getting ready to defend his thesis uh, in front of his department uh, with his mentor, Wilhelm Drake, who has kind of uh, shepherded him into the program. But his obsession with something known as the grand equation a uh, unifying theory for all of mathematics and uh, physics, uh, space time and all that, has kind of taken over his life and caused problems with his relationship with his girlfriend, Erisette. So on this day, he is wandering down, uh, wandering down a narrow alleyway. It's raining outside. And he's, it's getting towards nightfall, and he's on his way home thinking to himself, and the rain is pattering down, and the soft footfall of his footsteps clack in the alleyway. He's thinking to himself over some of the mathematical conundrums that have perplexed him as he's groped towards finding this uh, proof, which will help him unify and uh, get closer towards the grand equation. He's flipping a coin, a, a lucky silver penny, as he walks, he flips it with his thumb and catches it. And it tinks as it falls into his palm. And he looks to the right and he sees a book, a bookshop. It's called the Argos Bookshop. And he's walked this way many times, this road back to his apartment, his flat. Many times he's walked this way and he's never seen this bookshop. And it catches his eye, there's a, a soft light coming from inside like the glow of an oil lamp. And even though he's supposed to be home to meet Aristet for dinner, he can't help himself but to go in and take a look. And so he opens the door to the bookshop and there's a soft tinkle of bells as the door jingles. He walks inside, there's the musty smell of ancient books and he sees a fat man perched atop a stool behind the counter, uh, hiding behind a newspaper. And he's smoking. The smoke curls up around the newspaper, around in the bookshop, through the bookshelves. <laughs> and it makes Vallis cough as he comes in out of the cold. And he says hello to the man. The man does not respond. And so he, he feels almost pulled into this bookshop and he goes back through the dusty uh, shelves, their books piled high like towers to the ceiling. It's a complete chaos of books and it's wonderful. It just tickles his mind. And he knows that this bookshop has a book he is searching for. He doesn't know what it is, but it will help him. And so he shuffles through books and he is, is rearranging and he's heading towards the back, he, he maneuvers around a, a rather large, thick shelf that looks like it's leaning to one side. And he ends up in a corner. And there's a big red book that draws his attention. It's a very old leather book. Looks like it's dated back to the 1600s. It's a very beautiful uh, book, probably from the Renaissance, maybe from Italy. And he, he touches the book and he pulls it slowly off the shelf and it's heavy. It's much, much heavier than it looks. And he can smell the paper. Uh, it smells as though it's been, it's been waterlogged. It has a sweet sickly odor uh, that reeks, but also it, it uh, draws him in. And he opens the book uh, flat on the shelf. And as he does, the shelf disappears. And it leads back into a black hallway. And he, he puts the book down. And he knows he needs to go down this hallway. And so Valis walks down into the darkness. 
and he walks and the, the hallway seems to go on forever. And then he cannot see anything, but he can feel the smooth, cold surface of the wall to the left and to the right. And so he, he puts his coin into his pocket and he walks and walks. And finally, he can see a prick of light in the distance. And he continues to walk. And at last, he comes out onto a ledge, a ledge that looks out over a grand chasm scaling down hundreds, thousands of feet, miles below him into the deep inky blackness below and upwards into the deep inky blackness above and across this chasm and across from the ledge where he teeters precariously, he can see another building stretching great into the sky. It's gray, smooth surface looks like basalt shining with a, a, an eerie glow that he can't explain. And there are also, uh, uh, is also a ledge on this building and these buildings face each other with perfect sheer uh, parallelism. There are stairs lining these buildings and he decides to travel down this ledge. And so he carefully braces himself against the wall on the left as he walks and he can feel a dark wind rushing up from out of the chasm. It's deep and it's, it's, it's soft almost as it brushes his cheek. And there's a, a, an odor to it, like the smell of rotting bones. And he's trying to find a way up to these stairs and he keeps walking along this ridge, being very careful not to look over because he knows if he looks over the edge that it will paralyze him and his, his vertigo will take over and there will be no coming. but he knows he needs to keep going. And so he's traveling and he's, he makes it to a staircase and he starts climbing up the stairs, careful now not to look below. But as he does, he hears something from deep inside the can tossed together, the sound of something growing and, and tumbling and he can't help it now. He must look down into the chasm and he sees something reflecting light far below, down into the depths, something rising, not one something, but many somethings, a hundred, a thousand, a million somethings piling up out of the chasm, rising together. They are the skulls and the femur bones and the chest bone, they're rising the rib cage, bones upon bones rising up out of the chasm like a tide, tidal wave coming up towards him, filling the entire chasm. And as he sees them coming up towards him, he can't help but reach out and he falls, falls from his height on the stairs and he screams aloud, a loud piercing scream and he falls into the bones and the bones catch him like a blanket and they keep rising and rising and rising. Vallis awakes screaming in his bed. He is at home in his flat, lying there. He's drenched in sweat. He is safe. He is not in a chasm. There are no bones. He hears the clock in his apartment Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, clang, clang, and the bell keeps ringing, and he counts it. He cannot help but count. He cannot help but count the numbers in his head. And then it re he realizes that, no, he's just imagined it. It did not strike 13, did it? And he, he, he feels a hand uh, rubbing his, his, his shoulder. It's Ariset, and she is, she is calling to him. Valis, see, what happened? Is this the dream? I heard you screaming oh, in the kitchen. Uh, yes. I, I, I'm... You've been having these dreams. You've been, you've been having these dreams for months now. Oh. Stop. I think, I think you, we should talk. I think we, we need to talk. What's, what's, uh, what's wrong with you? What's going on? Is, is it this great equation thing of you again? This obsession I, I, of you? 
it it is it, it's it's just numbers dear it's it's nothing it's nothing to do with that nothing at all i, I was merely uh, yeah. thinking yeah don't take me thinking. for a fool valis it's not it's not because you're the mathematician and the great mat oxford mathematician that, that that you should that you can can think that i'm a fool this great equation of you is, is all about numbers and you you're counting and thinking and sometimes you sometimes i hear you sometimes i hear you talk alone you talk alone in the room and it's always about numbers you should consult maybe did you uh did you hear the clock strike i'm <laughs> I think I I think I'm late for work. Valis, our clock doesn't strike. What are you talking about? Oh, uh, you know what? Y you're right. I seem to be thinking of my last flat. You know, I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit flummoxed. Do you think you could um Do you think you could get me a cup of tea, please? I would really really appreciate that right now. Of course, my dear. Please, please, you know, calm down. You need to relax. I'm gonna get you a, a a warm cup of tea. And she and she stands up from the side of the bed, and she uh, she she's uh, she's about your height, uh, probably something like five foot nine. She's slim, gorgeous, beautiful. She's dressed in a in black jeans, uh, stretch jeans. She uh, she's wearing a white uh, pullover, and uh, she always looked good. She has this, you know, really uh, little makeup in her face that kind of warms up her face. She has these nice green eyes, kind, always kind. But she's been she's been distant and inquisitive recently. She 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 doesn't agree with this obsession of you and she 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 starts to show signs of um of distance in the kitchen you know valis if you're not careful you're gonna lose this girl is that really what you want you fool and he he rolls over at the bed and uh he just looks at her shape as she disappears around the corner into the kitchen. And he just realizes how lucky he is to have somebody who puts up with him when he's uh, so unattentive to her. And he vows that today he is going to change and that he is going to start trying to make her happy instead of asking for her to make all these concessions. The apartment is um, uh, a huge five and a half from the the university Oxford University University campus. It's, it's huge for uh, for the campus size um, type of apartment. Everything is wooden. The floors are really nice, uh, recently waxed, um, and all the, the all the the furniture comes with the apartment and it's all school furniture made of wood and leather and uh, the, every door, doorway have, uh, has wood surrounding it. Tall, big windows, really high ceilings. Uh, it's all open area in the kitchen and in the living room. And you have uh, uh, an office, uh, uh, a water room, a bathroom, a kitchen, a uh, dining room, and the the main uh, master bedroom, and uh, a couple minutes later, uh, you hear a reset footstep coming back in a room with uh, two uh, cup of uh, green tea uh, with lemon. As she sit next to you in the bed, in a really candid manner, she uh, she, she gives you a cup of tea. She looks at you, and she said. So what, uh, what do you think? Do you think we, uh, we should uh, consult together as a couple? Yes, I, I absolutely, you know I want that. Okay. 
you know I want that. I've been, I, I've been a little preoccupied, and I admit that. And I, and I just want to say that things are going to be different from here on out. After I'm done, after I get uh, a job at the university, uh, Professor Drake, he has been with me this whole way, and I, I'm, I'm sure that I'm going to get the position that I want. And things are going to change for us from here on out. And You've just... been, I don't like that. You've been saying this all along and this Drake, this Professor Drake, I'm sure he's the one putting you all these ideas in your mind. He's been, he's been, he's been a bad influence on you. I know how much you like him. I know, I know he's your mentor and all that, but uh, he's been, he, he makes you work too much. He's, he makes you do all these calculus and, and work and research and all that. You've, you don't count hour for him. You, he, he's using you. You need, you need to wake up, Valdis. He's using you. No, no, this isn't. No, I, I, I can't accept that. He, he's been with me from the beginning. He, he's the one who got me in here. He, he's supported me. I just can't accept what you're saying. She stands up. She uh, walks uh, toward the... Um, the, the, the drawer uh, in front of the bed, she slowly put her cup of tea on the wooden drawer. She turns around slowly, she looks at you, she sighs, and she, uh, she said, listen, Valis, I'm, I'm tired of this. If, uh, if you don't take measures, I cannot take them for, for you and nobody's going to take them for you. Maybe you're going to have to choose between the numbers, Drake and me. And she slowly leaves the room, grabs her coat, open the front door and gently leave the apartment, taking some precaution not to slam the door behind her and you can hear her footstep going down the stairs in the hallway as she leaves the building damn damn it Phyllis, you idiot you ugh. and he 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 rolls off the bed he he his brain a second behind his body and he tumbles as he realizes his foot is caught in his pajamas and he falls face first onto the wooden floor and it echoes loudly in his empty and cold apartment. And he just lays there, his face looking sideways under the dresser at his socks, which were shoved under there. And he just looks and thinks. Under the fool. dressers, uh, uh, under the dresser, next to the old sock and the dust, there's a watch. An old watch there, and it's ticking. And he's... and when your eyes see, and when your eyes see the, the, the ticking the ticking clock, the ticking stops, and kind of at the same spot. That that, that can't be. <laughs> no, I, I, this isn't. I, I'm. Am I still in this? And he rubs his eyes and, and looks back at the watch and it's still there. In fact, the only thing his father ever gave him, uh, it's, an, it's an old antique watch uh, with very fine craftsmanship. And it's been relegated to being stuffed underneath the dresser. And he thinks for a moment, maybe I should pick this up. Maybe. Maybe I should put it on, but he decides not to. No, no, better to leave it, leave it where it is, where the ticking will not bother him. And so at last he pushes off the ground and dusts himself off and he gets dressed, finishes his cup of tea and he looks out the window of the flat out into the cold fall morning it's raining again, of course, as always. And he thinks as he looks that he can see the slim profile of Erisette disappearing down the lane uh, among 
the honking horns of the cars and the vendors crying out, selling food. And he s decides that he will go outside and he will, he will try and find the bookshop in his dreams because he knows, yes, he remembers now where it is and he slips on his shoes. And at last, as he adjusts himself before the mirror, he pulls out a bow tie, a red, a, th a thick red bow tie, which Ariset gave him for his last birthday. And he realizes he's never even bothered to put it on all this time. He's never bothered. This, this is why she's upset. It's the bow tie. It's not all the other things. And he puts the bow tie on and he ties it just right. And he's got his blue shirt on with the red bow tie and he slips on his sport coat. And now he feels, this is, yes, this is what he will feel like as a professor, a new professor here at Oxford. And all the students that he's, he's going to teach will finally, he will get some respect. And he, he goes out the door, makes his way, clanging down the iron staircase in the flat and out onto the street. The streets are cold. Um, and there's a lot of people, but people are busy. People are, people are in a hurry. This late afternoon, uh, misty, misty UK, typical British um, fall, uh, late afternoon kind of day. There's a small mist uh, in the air that adds some coldness to the, the, uh, the humid and, uh, and cold uh, fall air that there is a you, you know your typical autumn uh, late afternoon the streets are dark because they are wet re reflecting the lights of the of the cars passing by people are like it's, it's people are just walking fast driving driving their bike riding their bike super fast and the cars are turning away from you people are just walking away from you every time you meet someone it's like they are in a hurry walking down the street toward uh, oxford university the campus is this uh everybody's a student everybody works in the university somehow everybody has a purpose uh, toward this institution and the feel of the neighborhood represent that uh, well the walking down the street is uh, is a is a lonely activity uh, on the Oxford campus because everybody is uh, minding their own business. Walking toward the um, Oxford Univers University, you arrive at the corner where uh, the bookshop uh, was on the right, and looking at the building, you see an empty, dark windows shut down door, dusty, run down, tacky, old, wet building with nobody inside, with the window shut down heavy and the door shut down heavy and uh, where there is absolutely no sign of life. The building is so tacky that there is this uh, greenish, um, almost like grass that comes out of between the bricks. It's this kind of moisturized, like uh, fungus thing that comes out in between the cracks of the bricks on the building. And uh, where the building ends, the, the front the brick wall of the building ends and meet the 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 sidewalk there is this thing this this greenish moisty um organic thing that connects and starts to crawl up the wall from the building and uh, especially where people used to walk uh you know in the in the doorway uh, inside the building And as, as Velas looks at the windows that uh, they, they're 
bay windows, they bend outwards. Uh, he peers in, he, he rubs furiously against the fog, which is condensed on the glass, and he keeps rubbing, but it just won't clear. Nothing will clear that, that fog on the glass. And he tries to look in, but there's no sight. He grabs the brass doorknob, the ancient brass doorknob. He shakes it violently. Let me in! And he begins pounding on the thick, heavy door. Let me in! And he's pounding on the door. And he's quite unaware that people are looking at him now and that he's making quite a fuss. The voice echo in the narrow streets of uh, Oxford University campus. Let me in, 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 let me in, in, in. And pe people are uh, not paying attention, kind of like um, walking away as fast as they can, thinking to themselves, another crazy. Who let him in on a campus? <laughs> running around, running. When you turn around, you're alone. And there is no sound on the street at all. All you hear is the sound of the water uh, from the, the, the top of uh, one of the houses on the other side of the street, <laughs> flicking down in, uh, in this big pound of water that goes down the canal, down the street. And v Velas turns around and um, he decides that, that uh, he's going to have to come back. He looks, he looks at the clock tower and he realizes that he's, he, he's late on the day of defending his thesis. He is late looking for this stupid bookshop and he begins to count to himself. It's a, it's a method he has uh, done many times to calm himself, counting by powers of two, two, Four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, two fifty-six, uh, five twelve, ten twenty-four, twenty forty-eight, forty ninety-six, eighty-one ninety-two, sixteen three eighty-four. He pulls out the lucky penny from his pocket as he walks along the, the the road, and he flips it. And just as he does, he trips over a pebble, and the penny goes tink tink down the cement and down the drain. And he's lost his lucky penny, it's gone. And he just thinks for a moment that if he can get down and look down the drain, he might catch a glimpse. It's really nothing, but he has, he's already late. So he gets down on the wet uh, cement and he looks in the drain, but the, the, the water has been running too fast and there's no sign of it. When, so, he, looks, when he looks down the drain, he sees the stairs and the gray tall building from the chasm going down, 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 and a set of stairs. And there's a wind blowing. The wind catches in his mouth. <gasps> and he feels panic gripping his chest <sighs> two four eight sixteen thirty two sixty four one twenty eight two fifty six and he falls over backwards he this can't be happening this isn't real he hurries on down the road down the road back to the campus over across the grass and up to up to his office where up to professor drake's office where he's supposed to be meeting with the professors the university is this as this really it's a huge 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 um uh, campus where you know you have the you have like gr a field of grass a, a long field of grass surrounded by by these buildings that has that has this beige um Really old school and but well maintained, well uh, well cleaned up to, uh, toward the years, and it has this look of an ancient uh, an ancient cathedral kind of thing. 
um, and, and, and it's, uh, everything is well groomed. The grass is perfectly green. The trees are perfectly cut. The, 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 red, the, the flowers that are dying because of the autumn season are, uh, are perfectly groomed as well, pre prepared for the winter season. And uh, at, this, at, at this hour of the, um, of the night, early, early night, really late uh, afternoon, early evening, really late afternoon, uh, there's not a lot of people around. And uh, entering, entering the big double doors, the big double wooden doors of the Oxford University main entrance, uh, you enter this really warm, really cozy, uh, dry, uh, you have this really warm and really cool, cozy, dry air that makes a big contrast with outside the, the moisty mist of uh, uh, of the air. Now inside, it's really every the, the sound. The sound seems a little bit muted uh, inside, and uh, as the door uh, closes behind you, uh, you hear the echo of the the big <laughs> door of the university closing behind you going up the stairs in front of you and echoing in the different kind of corridors. The floor is clean and shiny and bright and has these really nice uh, ceramic moti motives engraved into them. On the walls, there's all kinds of pictures and painting of the most important professors and students and, and researchers and people that have, that have made up, made up uh, Oxford University's um, reputation. Uh, walking toward uh, Professor Drake's uh, office, uh, you, uh, you are alone in, uh, in the university and your footstep echoes. And, and, and there is this, this, this weird squeechy sound of your wet foot sole on the floor going like me, 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 as they, as it slowly disappear, as the sole of your, of your shoes dries up from the warm temperature and the floors uh, of the university. And uh, arriving in the um, uh, mathematic uh, section at the end of a really, really long and lonely corridors, there is uh, this, uh, these, um, these, this really tall, it's like, it's like a one. It's a one door, but it's really long, and it's like a, in a circle like that. And it, it, opening the door, uh, you enter the big uh, uh, mathematic uh, laboratory. Doctor Drake likes to call it the 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 math lab. It's uh, it's this place where you have these gigantic green uh, chalk uh, chalkboard that you can flip around. So it's, and they are on wheels. So and there's like these on the um in the middle of the room there are there there are these um these leather leather uh, chairs where people where well this where the students sit and and go to the chalkboard and come back and sit again and they they discuss the the the, the theorems and the calculus that they made on the chalkboard and all that. In the back there's this huge library that goes to the ceiling with a ladder, a wooden ladder stick to it with bearings on top of it that can slide from east to west, full packed of mathematic books and old scrolls of uh, ancient mathematic theorems. There is a big, in the corner, there is this big um, uh, earth globe that is in this big wooden fixture where it doesn't move and it's covered in dust and in chalk dust, everything as this chalky dust um, uh, uh, feature on top of it because Dr. Drake's other uh, manic uh, habits is not to let the, uh, the cleaners in because the cleaners sometimes they come and they erase the great work of the mathematician on the, on, on the chalkboard desk, a big wooden desk. It's a total mess. It's a total mess. And behind this desk, there is this huge wooden with, with kind of, uh, I don't know how to say that, but the, the, with, with these, these, uh, this, this wooden chair with these, 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 uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the, I don't know how you call that, but it's this big wooden chair and behind, behind this desk, uh, 
Officer Drake's chair. And behind this chair, there's windows, gigantic windows that covers the whole wall. And, the, and you can see the whole campus uh, uh, go, uh, you know, from the windows, you know, going toward the horizon because uh, the, the, the math lab is on the, on the, on the fifth floor. And uh, outside, the windows are all wet from the mist and the moon is shining in the top right corner in front of the windows. Professor Drake is watching outside. He has his hand behind his back. He's wearing a burgundy turtleneck, skinny, fit on his skinny, skinny ass, really skinny uh, buddy. He has these dark hair with a separation on the right. And, I, and as, you, as you open the door, he turns around slowly, looks at you. He has his, his, his jaw full of tension. His lips are tight. He looks at you with his dark, his dark eyes and asks, where have you been? I've been waiting on you all afternoon, being four hours late, four hours, 11 minutes and 35 seconds late. Now tell me, is it that girlfriend of yours? Or is it this grand equation, obsession of yours that, that, that takes all this time and energy that makes everybody wait for you? This is an unacceptable, Valis. Unacceptable. And as Valis opens his mouth to, to explain it all, to, to try and, and, and make him see, he opens his mouth, but just as he does, something pops in his head. Uh, it's, it's something he's remembering from the book that he opened in the dream in the bookshop. He sees inside the book a part of a theorem. Yes, the missing theorem. And he turns on Professor Drake and he runs. Uh, he stumbles back over to the, one of the giant chalkboards. There's a kid there uh, uh, putting something on it. He bumps him out of the way and he pulls out a piece of blue chalk and he begins to rub off the, the, the equation that was on there and write what he's remembering quickly, quickly before he forgets. He's scribbling down the theorem as fast as he can. Yes, this is the piece. This is the piece I've been missing. Professor Drake slowly walks towards you, sits in one, in one of the leather chairs that are in the middle of the room. He crosses his right leg over his left leg and adapting this kind of pose, he's looking at you with no expression on his face and says, we've been over this already, Valis. This doesn't work. I told you already, the trigonometrical variables doesn't match the parallel omega synthesis. Professor. Of the square, of the square root of 69, which doesn't compare to the pi variable of an half of a quarter of the center of the axis. Why are you still, why are you still trying to prove that to me? We've been over this before. This, this time I have it, this time I, I have it. And, and, and as Velas stops scrawling the equation, he, he looks down to see what he has written and, and to see finally that he has the piece and all he sees on the chalkboard that he has scrawled in blue, bright blue chalk is 
2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. It is not the equation from the book at all. It is mere gibberish. You see, like we discussed already, this sequence of yours that you keep proposing like that demands, it demands a different sort of variables. And this kind of variables hasn't been theorized yet. So you cannot just throw these numbers at us thinking that we will understand what's going on in this obsessive mind of yours. It is at that moment that as Valus looks at Professor Drake, he notices a detail which he has never noticed before. And he looks at Professor Drake. Professor Drake is wearing a bright red bow tie. It is the same bow tie he has on now. And it dawns on him, no, <laughs> no, this can't, this can't be it. This can't, no, this can't be happening. This, where did you get that bow tie, Professor? Where did you get that? I said, at, where did you get that? At this moment, you hear footsteps in the corridor. And Eriset enters the room. She's all wet. Her hair are sticking to her face. She's um, breathing heavy, like she's been running from the, from the rain outside. The rain and the wind has grown stronger. You can hear on the, on the windows of the, uh, of the math lab, the rain in the wind go. As she enters the room and she says, hey, calm down. Valis, calm down. Why are you screaming like that? You. And Drake, at this moment, says, She's right, Valis. Calm down. Why don't you sit down? We need to talk. You're with him, aren't you? You have been with him. This whole time, Eriset, you lied to me. I know what you're up to. I know what game you're playing. I see the look in your eye. I can't believe I've been such a fool. I've been so preoccupied. I didn't even see it. She, she, uh, she looks at you kindly. She, uh, she looks a little bit toward uh, Professor Drake. And then she comes back to you. She says, I'm actually here only to meet Professor Drake and you together because I knew you were, and I wanted to have a talk with you both at the same time and trying to figure out what's wrong with you. Professor Drake has been kind enough to wait for me that late in the office to make sure that we, we can have this conversation together. Don't, don't, be so, don't be so paranoid, Valis. It's not paranoia. It's the truth. Tell me, Professor, how long has this been going on? And tell me, Professor, why have you decided to backstab me and to block my research? Why have you decided to destroy everything that is so important to me? And as he says this, there's, there's a clatter on the tables in the room. The clatter increases. The, the clatter of pens bouncing up and down, the calculators clicking against tables, the clatter of chairs rattling, the clatter of books shuffling off their shelves and tumbling to the floor, and the clatter of chalkboards rattling 
the clatter of teeth as they're jostled by some unknown force, which is shaking the entire room, the clock outside, the giant clock tower, clang, clang, strikes 10 o'clock p.m., clang, and the room continues to oscillate, to vibrate, and there begins to be screams rising up from some of the students who are studying now. They are, they cannot ignore, this is not an earthquake, this is far more violent, whatever this is. They begin running for the exits, the students running, jumping over each other, knocking over chairs, book bags, set a through, bookshelves now cascading over like dominoes, knocking into each other, falling against each other. Ariset and, and grabs Valis by the arm, Valis grabs Ariset, but then, just then, Something rends in the room. A giant eye appears. And at the center of the eye, this giant iris, is the swirling vortex of a giant hole leading down into the chasm that he saw below. Ariset grabs for Valus. Valus grabs for Ariset. It is sucking at them. Wait. No. No. As she I, screams, I have you. As she don't let like, go. Don't let go. She's grab my hand. Grab my hand. <sighs> and, and 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 she 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 tries. She trying to grab your hand, but she's been sucking, sucking through um uh, toward toward the big eye, the big eye that has this look. And then, and then this big eye thing starts to get bigger and bigger and covering all the rooms and there's water. There's like a waterfall coming out of, of the eye. And, in the, in, and she's been, um, she, she starts to, to, to be sucked in toward the, the iris. At the same time, Willem Drake lifts in the air, cannot touch the ground anymore. He grabs her feet because he, he wants to hold on to this reality. But he's been sucked in in the middle of the iris and, and, and you, you can see that he, he has, a, he has um, this look in his face where he's, I'm not gonna leave this place, you're gonna come with me. And then he's just whoosh, being sucked in toward the uh, center of the eye into the chasm. And Valis lunges for Ariset. He, he half-heartedly lunges for Drake, but he knows, he knows he can't reach him because Drake is being sucked too far out of his reach, but he can still, there's still time to grab Erset. Erset, don't let go. Don't let don't go. Don't let me go. No, the, don't let me go. But the water now, the water has, is rising up to his knees. It's rising up to his waist. Pretty soon it will cover his head. And, and the water has drenched his arm. It's slippery and he can feel the lotion on her hands. It's slipping his fingers. She's down to the last two fingers. Don't let go! He throws his backpack off of his shoulder. She grabs the strap. The strap holds for a moment and then rips. And she is sucked into the chasm, down, down into the chasm of bones with a final scream. And he can see William Drake also... But now, as he looks outside, he can't help but see something has converged with the clock tower. Yes, it is Wilhelm Drake. He has molded into the arms of the clock. His legs have become the hour hands, and his hands have melded into the minute hand. And with a final scream, the chasm, the eye, gives a final blink and closes. As it closed, the, the, the figment of reality behind it, which was the, the center of the eye, was the, the, the chalkboard where the numbers were written. And as the eye closes, uh, the chalkboard, the reality behind it, the chalkboards do a, 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 some kind of like a, a rubber band effect where... And it becomes back to reality again. 
the room is a, is a total mess. The paper has been flying in the air. There's still some paper coming down the ceiling, spinning like tornadoes in the corner. The books in the big library, uh, in the bag, in the big bookshelf, in the back of the room, and some of them have been thrown. In one of the window behind the, the uh, Professor Drake uh, desk has exploded, and one of the other has been shattered with cracks in it. The rain and the wind are throwing uh, water inside inside the uh, the office, and uh, and uh, we can hear uh, some um, some sirens of uh, of police and firemen uh, outside in the distance. Phallus looks down at his sodden body. His clothes are completely drenched with sweat and water and sickly black bile from the iris of the eye. It has, it has stained his clothes. He looks at his hands. They too are stained with black ink. He, he runs out of the room and he doesn't remember how, but he runs and runs and runs until he is back at his flat. And there is a knock at his door Inspector Williams, Vallis Whitlock, are you in? Police! Police, open the door! Mr. Whitlock! Yes, yes, and he opens, opens the door. Yes, I, I'm here, I'm here. Outside, there's nobody. This is, I, I must be losing my mind. I must be losing my mind. This this can't be happening. This isn't happening. And he runs back into the, 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 the empty, the all too cold and empty apartment. And he begins throwing things into his throwing things into his suitcase. And he knows that his career now at Oxford is ruined, that his life is ruined, that he can't even he doesn't even know if this was if any of this was real in the first place and he packs his suitcase and then he just sits on it and he doesn't know how long he has been sitting on his suitcase but he sits there in his empty apartment he sits there and he sits there and waits and waits and then one one day one week one month there is a phone call ring 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 ring, ring. And he looks at his cell phone, and it is an old friend. It is a name. It is a name he can trust. It is a friend from, from Canada. Yes, this, this person will know how to help. He clicks on the call. Valis? Valis Whitlock? Hi, this is Professor Edwin Gallagher. We, uh, we discussed before on your article about the grit equation. Listen, listen. I know, I know you've been working with Professor Drake. He, he's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for a long time, even if we don't agree on most of the stuff. But listen, listen. The, the, your grit equation theory is amazing. And, 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 and we at McGill University in Montreal we want to work with you. We want to talk about this again. And it, it, it's really important. If you want to come over, I'm going to have a postdoctoral study grant uh, fellowship of uh, university uh, ready for you. I can pick you up at the airport uh, next week. If you look in your email, I already sent you a plane ticket because I'm sure, I'm sure you, will, you, 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 you want to come over. You, well, what do you think? What do you say? Do you think a Professor Drake would let you go? Uh, 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 yeah. The words struggle to make their way out of Valis's mouth. Y yes, y Professor Drake, yeah, yes. Yes, Professor Gallagher, I, I will come. I will meet you at the airport. 
Oh. oh, chap, chap, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you accept my invitation. We have so much thing we need to talk about. I have so many questions for you. This is brilliant. This is brilliant. I'm telling you, it might gonna change the course of a lot of things. <clears throat> That's excellent. That, wow, that really, that really is excellent. And as he says these words, his heart feels anything but full of happiness and joy, but only he feels despair. And he, he puts the phone down and, and cries. But the very next day, well, the very next week, he, he meets Professor Gallagher at the airport. And he sees his old friend with his, uh, his familiar black cob hat that he's put on and his old wrinkles, uh, his familiar smile, and, and all of this. Yes, he can put all of this behind him, all of this nonsense, which it, it must not have even happened. It, it couldn't have happened. None of this. It was real. This is, this is my new life now. Yes, I can put all of that behind me. Professor Gallagher, it's, it's so good to see you again. It's been so very, very long. Shall we grab a cup of coffee? Of course, chap. I know, I know I'm a lot of good place here in Montreal. I'm going to show you around. Um, so so, he, so he, he, he grabs some of your luggage. Uh, he, he, he leads you toward the parking lot. He has this big, shiny Cadillac, old Cadillac from the 80s. It's really clean and it smells really good. And it's like there's some really smooth jazz music with no lyrics, you know, just some really good jazz music coming out from, um, from the stereo. As you guys uh, drive toward downtown area, arriving in downtown area, Montreal in, in, uh, in the autumn season um, is, uh, you know, it, 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 you are in, in, in late November, so the, there's no more leaves in the, no more leaves in the, in the trees. And um, it's, uh, it's way colder than the UK. The, the, the air is freezing and there, and he, and, he, um, and there is some, uh, some warm air coming out of the, of the eater in the car. Arriving in the downtown area, um, it, uh, it's, a, it's a Saturday night. There is a lot of car, a lot of traffic, a lot of people in the streets. And, uh, and, he, and, and on the way there, he talks to you about how the university is this great place for research in mathematics and that he, 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 uh, you need to, uh, he's going to introduce you to all kind of really good postdoctoral students and that, that, that he's been talking about, he's been lecturing about your articles and your theory for a long time now, almost two years, and that he has been waiting on this for so long, but Professor Drake was not returning his calls and all that, so he took the opportunity to write to you himself and... And then now that you're accepting this offer, this offer is so happy. And, he, and he, as you guys are getting out of the car, uh, he, he shows you a couple corner uh, street, a really nice, uh, a really small, old school coffee shop with, um, with these uh, wooden and cement counter and uh, really old tables. Uh, and, and it's kind of empty. And there is just um, there is just like there's a brick wall on the right. There's this this really small uh, front uh, windows that leads to St. Catherine Street, and uh, where a lot of people are walking by, going into uh, you know the Saturday night. So people are well dressed up and and smell some perfume in the air when you every time you cross somebody on the street. And then you are entering the coffee shop. There's this strong smell of coffee, and he says, "Oh." Sit, my friend, sit. Uh, I really want to talk to you about this. This is the best coffee in town. It's, co it's, it's called Coffee Shop um, uh, Vista. Uh, Vistas. Like, uh, and, and, he, and he explains to you, like, this, this place is Vista's the best barista in the city. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Please sit, sit. What, what kind of coffee do you, do you drink? Um, I'll just take uh, black and so... He, uh, they order the coffee and he, he sits down. They both sit down and soon it's served. And, uh, and Professor Gallagher rambles and rambles, but 
But uh, Valus doesn't hear what he's saying. He can only look into the deep, dark swirl of the coffee below him. And he hears uh, a whistling, like the sound of the wind above him. And it grows stronger and stronger and stronger. The sound of something falling, falling. And then there is a plop in his coffee. Something has fallen into his coffee. He, he reaches in, grabs it with his two fingers, and he shakes it. It is his lucky penny. And he says to Professor Gallagher, I, I guess it's my lucky day. All right. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. Talk to you soon.